Some of you are bothered by the fact that there's a thing there and that it's got a covering over it and that you can't see it and you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And I'm not going to take that cover off until the end of the message today. And then you'll see it. And it's going to drive you crazy and add tension to the room the whole time. And I'm for it. I'm for it. Um, Let's go right to John chapter 1, verse 1. All right, so we're going to read this because this is John. And he's describing who Jesus is. And if you know the Gospels, you know we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written by the original apostles to Jesus And each of them wrote from a slightly different perspective. The same story, the same truth, the same person, but they came at it from their way. And John's unique way in the Gospel of John is that scholars tell us he wrote this book very much later in life. And he knew the other three Gospels were out there. And John has this perspective of a somewhat older person with a lot of experience and a lot of time who has looked back and said, this is who Jesus was. I see it now. And so in John chapter one, he's gonna go back and he's gonna kind of summarize for us what Jesus was all about and what he learned about him. So sit down with John here real quick. John 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word. And I'll pause you just real quick right there. The Greek there for word is logos. And what John is saying, and I know it's a weird way to describe Jesus, but he calls him like a title. He calls him the word. The Greek there is logos. And logos is a word. It's, it's knowledge. It's, it's wisdom. It's expression. And, and John says the essence of who Jesus was is Jesus was God speaking to us. See, God was hidden, and then God decided to reveal what he was actually like to us. That's why he had to come, and he had to be face-to-face with us and say, this is what my personality is actually like. And he cared enough about us to live amongst us. And so he was the expression. He is the word of God. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Some of you might wonder, is there a Bible verse anywhere that says that Jesus was actually God, not just a teacher? You just read it. He was in the beginning with God, right at the creation. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was God's instrument in creation. Everything was created through him. Now verse four is beautiful. In him was life. So he had life and the life was the light of men. So Jesus has life and that's why he's creator Because he possessed life. Not like you give life to your child, but he possessed life supernaturally in a way that he could give life to any creature he wanted to. He could give it. And then that life was the light of men. It says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So he is life, but he's also light, which means he illuminates every dark place in your life. Verse 10 He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know Jesus. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. Isn't that the story? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, I need to describe that to you really quick. So when Jesus came, there were people, the vast majority of people did not receive him, but some did. And to those that received him, to those who accepted him, to those that believed he was God, believed he was the Messiah, they let him in. To those people, they had the right to become the children of God. Now, we talked in January about children of God. We talked about the fact that we are made with the Imago Dei. Do you remember that? And that every man, woman, child, regardless of race, religion, anything, they are all made with the Imago Dei, the spark of divinity in them. And therefore they have value and they have worth as people, regardless of what their spiritual position is. So physically, you're a child of God. But it brings in another aspect here and says, yeah, but you might not be submitted to God spiritually. You might not have let him in to your soul And those who choose Jesus and surrender to him, there's a change that happens in their soul and they become a child of God spiritually. It's a big deal. But many did not accept him. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us 
And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So, so, so the glory, that, that glory, that's a Bible word, right? It just, it just means like the glow that comes off a light bulb, right? It, it means the thing that you see that can sometimes be hidden, but when it's revealed, you get hit by the full impact of it, right? It's like God was hidden. You didn't see God. Jesus came and now you saw is what it's trying to say. And when you saw his glory, what you saw was he gets detailed about it. He says, you saw grace and truth. You saw somebody that was full of grace and truth. What do you mean full of grace and truth? How can, I, how can I be full of two different things at the same time? You can't. It's a paradox. So we're going to go into that more deeply. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. So John is really, really clear. He's like, you know, in the Old Testament, Moses, he's the guy who brought us the Ten Commandments, right? Right? He's the guy who brought us all of God's expectations, all of God's truth, all of God's laws and says, this is the holy standard. It's like a measuring stick and he's holding it up to humanity. That's what Moses did. And guess what? Every single one of us stepped up to the measuring stick and fell short. And it was truthful to us, but very depressing. (laughs) So Moses did his part and he brought the law. But Jesus came to bring us the truth, but also grace. Grace and truth, an incredible combination. So how do we see this actually? So that's our reading there in John 1. Let me give you one of the the accounts of how Jesus walked out this fullness of grace and truth. So some of you know this story. This is in John chapter 8. There's a woman who's caught in adultery. In the very act of adultery, she and a man, and just whatever, you know, in the act of adultery, and some religious leaders, and I don't know how that went down, but somehow they went in and they grabbed her. And they hauled her off into some kind of public square where Jesus was, and they throw her down in front of Jesus. And you notice they didn't grab the guy. Whatever. They just grab her. And they throw her down in front of Jesus and said, we're supposed to stone her, right? Because she was caught in the act of adultery. At no point does anybody make an argument about whether or not she did it. It's just assumed in the passage. And what they're doing is they're setting up a test. And it's not just a test, it's a trap. And it's not just any kind of test or trap, it's a grace-truth test. And they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, which one will you choose? Because you can only choose one. Because if you agree with the Old Testament law that she's guilty of this, then she deserves to be executed right here in our midst. That's truth. However, if you want to be soft, if you want to be compromising... If, if you want to have no standards, Jesus, and be one of those people, then go ahead and forgive her and be merciful, I guess. And then we'll have an opinion about you. Either way, we're going to have an opinion about you. And see, and there's different, there's different layers to it. And some of you guys know that he would not have had the right under Roman law to execute this woman. And so it was a trap. He could have been arrested if he had done it. If he had done nothing, there would have been consequences for that as well. It was a well-formed trap that they put him through. And then Jesus, as brilliant and creative as ever, lets his nature flow out into the situation. And that's what you got to understand today. He didn't just sit back and plan what to do. He is full of grace and truth. So when he stepped into that situation, he did what his nature dictated. His heart came out. And he gets down in the dirt and he starts to write. And you know this. And he starts to write. And then he looks up at them and says, the the one who is without sin, he gets to cast the first stone. He gets to start the process of killing her. And of course, none of them have zero sin and they all know it. And I would love to know what Jesus is writing down and John doesn't tell us. It's horrible. Is he writing their names down like biggest sinners first? Is he writing their sins down? Are they looking down at the list and saying, oh God, don't put my name next to that. Who knows? But the passage says that as he's writing and he keeps writing, they all just start to walk away one at a time. And finally, there's nobody left. And when there's nobody left, he gets down at her level and he talks to her face to face. 
And he says, neither do I condemn you. He says, but go and sin no more. Go and stop living this life of sin that got you here in the first place. So I don't condemn you. And by the way, I'm the only person who ever lived that was holy and could actually condemn you. And I'm not going to do it because that's the grace of God. He was going to die for her. He did die for her. But then he cares about her enough to say, you've not been living truth though. And he gives her both. He is the perfection of grace and truth. And I could go story after story through the gospels. I could tell you how Jesus dealt with his parents when he was 12 and you'll see grace and truth there. I could talk to you about Zacchaeus, you'll see grace and truth there. I could talk to you about Peter's denials and you'll see grace and truth there. The woman at the well, you'll see grace and truth there. It just pours out of him every single time. The rich young ruler, there's grace and truth there. Every single time. Jesus is perfect and we're not. Yes, second service? Come on, waking up. That was an easy one. It's like a... Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> we're, we're more like a pendulum. We swing one way or we swing the other. Yes? In our society, we're either all grace or we're all truth. Like, like and, and, and you can see this all over the place. Like, when we're all truth, when we're in that quadrant, maybe that's where you live or you've seen people live, that's like the angry street preacher with the megaphone. We actually had one on my college campus, for real. And he would sit there and he would yell at college students and tell them what their sins were and why they were going to hell and God was mad. Oddly, there was never an altar call and no one ever came forward. Oddly. But that's an approach. And some people have that approach. But you're way over here in truth and without grace. Pharisees come in all shapes and sizes, do they not? And they're in the church and they're in your families. And, and, and there's, there, there's so many different ways that Pharisees present themselves. Sometimes Pharisees present themselves in the church as I'm judging everybody's lifestyle and their behavior. And if they don't have the behavior I think they should, they are sub-Christians. They're not real Christians. Or I go and I analyze a pastor's teaching or a Sunday school leader's or a, or a small group leader's teaching. And if they don't have precise doctrine, they're out and they're not in like the rest of us. And there's so many different theological issues where you can draw lines based on people's understanding. There are some Pharisees present in the church that if you aren't social justice enough, they will judge you. Because they're so harsh truth. You had coaches in your life that were super harsh truth to you. You had parents that were all truth. They would tell it to you right to your face. And it was okay that they were a jerk because at least they told the truth. Yes? And this goes all over our society. This is cancel culture. This is, this is our political divisions. If you don't agree with us, you're out. You're not a real whatever it is. Like we, we draw big, big lines because we're all truth. Where's the grace? We've swung the pendulum. And the pendulum needs some grace with it. But you can also swing it back the other way. And you can be all grace and no truth and no wisdom and no boundaries. And in, in that world of, of no wisdom, you have chaos. And you have pain and you have destruction. And that that takes all kinds of forms, itse or for forms itself. We got pastors and priests who won't talk about sin at all. Pastors and priests who won't tell you the truth about you, even if the Bible tells them so. Pastors and priests who won't be honest because they're being so forgiving. And sometimes internally you struggle with that. Because you're like, I know the Bible that I'm reading when I'm at home alone. And sometimes it doesn't add up. It doesn't fit. And we see it. We see this high grace, the, this no boundaries kind of world where there's no truth at all. We see it in the political realm where we can tell lies and there are no consequences. We can tell lies and we treat everybody in society like it doesn't even matter. Ah, we're getting, getting quiet. The business people who have no boundaries and say, as long as the market will bear it, I can do it. Doesn't matter who I hurt. 
as long as there's more money in the bank at the end of it? The Godfather taught us that, right? And then there's movie stars who have no boundaries in their life, and they teach us all that if you're pretty enough and have enough money, you can sleep around with whoever you want to, and there should be no consequences for that. And if you get into drugs or you get addicted to drugs, that's just a sign of rebellious youth, and it's beautiful. And there's no boundaries on that, and there's no wisdom on that. All grace, no truth. Even academics have taught us that there's no ultimate truth. Been to a university lately? Been going on a long time. It's the way I was taught in the university. There is no truth. It's all relative. Everybody just gets thrown onto the same level playing field. And if that's good for you and that's your truth and that's your way, then great for you. Here's just, it just doesn't work is the problem. It, 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 it treats truth like truth isn't truth. You ever see Pirates of the Caribbean and Captain Barbosa? And he says, they're not actual rules. They're more like guidelines. <laughs> they're more like guidelines. It sounds so much softer and nicer, doesn't it? But here's the problem. Do you know who actually cares about absolute truth? Scientists do. Scientists who are trying to land rockets don't say, well, this is my calculation. No, there's got to be an actual way. Mathematicians who want their calculations to actually work, they work in the realm of actual truth. Doctors who are trying to prescribe medicine and procedures to you, they live in the realm of actual truth, do they not? So, so why, if all these people where it actually matters, they have to deal in actual truth in a universe where actual truth exists, why do we think when it comes to our eternal souls, it's all relative? It doesn't make sense. Because one plus one equals two. And if that's the nature of the universe, then it must be the nature of the creator of the universe. Truth must matter. And I think when you live, you find that truth matters. See, we need grace and we need truth. And we can't pendulum back and forth. And some of you guys, you, you, when you think about your past and you think about the people that have hurt you in your past or the people that have confused you in your past, they were either all grace or they were all truth. See, this is a big issue. We often get this mix wrong and we hurt each other and we confuse each other. Too harsh or too soft. It's like, yeah, Goldilocks, right? We got to get it just right. So which one are you? Can I put the pendulum back up there? Are you a people pleaser? Or are you a no-nonsense, tell-it-like-it-is guy? How do you lean? Because we all have a way. We all have a, like, a starting point where we start. I start at people pleaser personally. And I've got to work to find the truth aspects for myself. People pleasers tend to be a little bit on the mushy side, amen? We tend to not want to tell people the hard things. We want, to, we, we want to not be confrontational because we want people to be happy. And if people aren't happy, and if people aren't happy with us, we even struggle to sleep at night. It's true, it's real, it adds stress. But we won't give people the kind of structure that they need, the kind of wisdom that, that, that they need. See, it's the wisdom of God that pulls people back from the ledge. And we've got to give people that. Even the people pleasers are in the room. We've got to give people that. And some of you are tell it like it is people. No nonsense. Like, I can be a jerk as long as I tell you the truth and it doesn't matter. Right? Like, I told you the truth, so everything should be all right. It doesn't matter if I was harsh. It doesn't matter if I didn't consider your past or consider what you're carrying today. I just hit you with the truth and it's okay. But it's not okay. Because love should ask us questions before we tell people the truth. Love should ask us questions about how we tell people the truth. And you've got to have a balance. Grace without truth is condemnation. Or truth without grace is condemnation. Grace without truth is compromise. Truth without grace pampers us. Grace without truth hammers us. Truth without grace crushes us. Grace without truth spoils us. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. Grace with truth is medicine. 
Pastor Chris Hodges said that. We need both every day. Like practically in our lives, we need both. So let me read some scriptures to you just really quick. I want you to see this in the letters of Paul that he wrote to us. Ephesians 4.15, he says, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. He says, speak the truth, but you got to speak it in love. We know this. Next, this is about evangelism. 1 Peter 3.15, he says, in your hearts, reserve Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. But I thought it was a debate with non-Christians, God. I thought I was supposed to yell at them. I thought I was supposed to win the argument. Ooh, that's not what that says. It says, actually, you're not aggressively going after people like a used car salesman. Instead, you're waiting for someone to ask you the question. And guess what happens there? When they ask you the question, that means the Holy Spirit was stirring in them. And now you have the evidence of God's activity before you even got started, which is the way it always happens. You give them an answer. You don't back down. You enter in boldly and you tell them the truth in that moment. For sure, that's tough. Give them the truth, but with gentleness and respect. Not a debate. There's nothing to win. You just told them the truth. Then you got Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And this, I I love this verse here because it's not just about our words. It's about every single thing that we do in the faith has to be done in love. You can't just do your faith with Jesus. Everything that you do as part of your supernatural spiritual life has to be done in love. Because then it'll make sense. I'll give you an example. I've shared this before, but um, Linda and I, when we had kids, um, back when we had actual young kids living in the home, we had this guideline where we said you had to finish your plate. Anybody have parents who made you finish your plate and you're still overeating today as you finish your plate? (laughs) Anyway, uh, so so it was a (laughs) bit... It was a big deal to us. And uh, anyway, I'm not trying to give a parenting seminar. It's just what we decided to do, okay? And uh, we decided to do it, and we were, we were highly structured with it, and you had to, we were trying to drive nutrition. Now I'm trying to defend myself anyway. Um, <laughs> so you had to clear your plate. And if you didn't clear your plate, there were no snacks that night. So you weren't going to sugar yourself up after you ignored the green beans, basically. Yeah. And so we held to it, man, and we were hardcore. And, uh, and it was just every single time. And it's like, and if you, if you don't want to eat it, then you pay the price and that's on you. And, and it was all fine. But some nights we went to DQ after dinner. And it, it, we just, we liked DQ. And it was like two blocks away from our house at the time. And so this one night, one of our kids didn't clear their plate. We went to DQ and we knew exactly how it was going to go, okay? Like they were not going to get an ice cream cone. Sorry. And it had happened countless times before that because I have stubborn kids. They get it honest. Um, So we get there and we sit them, literally we sit them down at one of the tables and they're going to not get ice cream and the rest of the family goes up to get ice cream. And I've got a heart somewhere in here. I really do. I promise you. (laughs) But that's what we were doing that day. And I just, after we got all of our ice cream, we walked back to the table. I just... Clear as day, I felt like the Lord came in and said, tonight's different. Tonight, you're going to show them grace and you're going to let them go get an ice cream cone. And man, I just, if I could honor, and I'm not even going to tell you which kid this is, but if I could just honor them, they were sitting there just awesome, like ready to accept, you know, it was just great. But I got to look and say, hey, go up and order what you want because today's not about Law, today's about grace. And man, it was, it was a great moment. Dumb ice cream. But it was like, but God let me walk in it for just a minute. And it's like, 
Those of us who are so great at structure, do we let grace creep in sometimes? Because I think it needs to. And those of us who are all grace, and there's no boundaries at all, you know? Like maybe there needs to be some truth. But we got to find that balance. We've got to operate our faith in love toward other people. I think it matters. So finally over here. You ready for a magic trick? It's not a magic trick. Okay, so on one side, we've got milk. And the other side, we've got iced coffee. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I'm already in latte mode. What would you like? That's a barista moment. Um, so here's, here's how this illustration is going to go. Um, Grace. <laughs> Truth. Anybody seeing the point yet? Here's the thing. I'm making a mess. <laughs> Jesus is full of grace and truth. That's what the scripture told us. Here's what it didn't tell us. It didn't tell us he was a balance. It did not tell us he was a tension of grace and truth. It said he was full of grace and truth. That doesn't work. Full of both doesn't work. Not in our humanity. It doesn't work. How can he be both at the exact same time? Because he's God. Why can't I be both at the exact same time? Because I'm not God. And neither are you. So this is the little advanced moment. And if you don't like it, just stop listening. But here's the thing. While I'm saying be full of grace and truth just like Jesus is, psh, you can't be. And neither can I. And that verse in the New Testament says, be holy for I am holy. You can't do that one either. Where Jesus says, love other people just like I've loved you. You can't do that one either. Not in your humanity. You're not able to. And you know how we screw this up? We come to situations all the time. Parents, people in marriages, people at business. In all their situations, you come into these moments. And even those of you who know the verses and you're trying what you're going to try to do is, is give them some grace and give them some truth. You're going to give them your little balance for the day. Guess what? Your mix is wrong. It's probably going to be wrong. You confused yet? You're like, so why even try? Here's what the Bible does to us. And here's where it gets weird. Is it says, let Jesus fill you. It says, reach out to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. The Christian life is that you would keep in step with the Holy Spirit as he fills your soul. And when the Bible talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, what it's really describing is let him control you. Jesus, take the wheel. It's not that I've got the wheel and I'm going to decide how to stay in the balance. Nope. You come into that really difficult conversation with your kid and it's not, let's do an ice cream cone because that's what we did last time and it worked. Some of you are trying to do situations because they worked before and they're not working again. Or they worked with your parents and they're not working with you. Or they worked in that book you read, but they're not working with you. You know what you need to do? You got to come to the end of yourself. You got to say, Jesus, take control. Because I can't be simultaneously filled with grace and truth. I'm no good at it. But you are. It somehow works for you. So what I got to do is I got to be filled with you. Jesus, what should I do? Jesus, what should I say? Lead me, Lord. Do you see where prayer starts to come in? Do you see where Christianity isn't so much a self-help religion as it is a submission to the Savior? Yeah. 
My only hope is that he comes in and that he's the one who gives me direction. Jesus, you got to save my family. We just did a marriage series, seven weeks of a marriage series. Are you praying yet? Jesus, save my family. Jesus, resurrect my relationship with this kid that we're not talking to each other anymore. You've all got it. You've got to be filled with him. That's why it's a paradox. Let's see the paradox at the cross. Because Jesus is the perfect mix always. He is the mix for every moment. God, I need the mix for this moment. Here it is at the cross. So Jesus comes to us. He comes to humanity. And he speaks to us the truth, does he not? He doesn't hold back. He tells us exactly what's broken. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know what that means? That means this broken world, it's not this broken world, it's our broken world. You know why it's ours? Because we broke it. Okay, Adam and Eve, whatever. Yeah, they did. But if they hadn't, you would have. So would I. And so we break everything. We break our kids and we break our marriages. We break our families. We break our schools. We break our churches. We break our cities. We break our countries. We break the world. We just do. We pour all of us out into it and things go bad. And so God comes and he tells us the truth. And because it's our broken world that we're responsible for, justice says we deserve consequence. Because any system of justice anywhere that works means that the cruel and the evil and the selfish must pay consequences for what they do. And God's justice is no different. So we go from truth to justice on the cross because that's why Jesus is on the cross because somebody has to pay. You don't want to pay. You want him to pay. And so here comes love. Because God could have been from a distance, like Bette Midler said, but he's not. And he's not cold, and he's not king, and he's not way out there. He's the father who came near to us. Come on, second service. He's the God who came near. He had to. Why? Because fathers rescue their kids. See, that's what love is. And so that's what the cross became. So he comes loving and rescuing. All of a sudden, grace comes because the only way to have all that justice and all that truth and all that love at the exact same time is that he had to pay it. And that's grace. As Jesus says, paid in full. He died so that you don't have to die. And all of a sudden, all the stuff full of grace and truth, it all comes to bear on the cross. Amazing grace. Amen. Amen. There's this old book and they've made plays and musicals and movies out of it. It's called Les Miserables. And some of you have watched that and you're like, why, what am I even watching here? This old French thing. Like, why does it matter? And here's why it matters. Because this old book, it's this huge book. Don't try to read the book. It's crazy. But it's beautiful. And this old guy, Victor Hugo, wrote this, and he was this amazing Christian man. And in the midst of this story, you've got these two characters, and I'm going to read to you about these two characters just real quick. But you've got this guy named, actually, could you take that down for a second? I'm not ready to read it. And I don't want them skipping ahead. <laughs> Say Valjean. Valjean. Valjean, you got it. So there's this guy, Jean Valjean is his name. And when he's a teenager, his, his family's starving. And he goes and he steals a loaf of bread so that they don't starve. And he's arrested and he's thrown into prison for way too long just for helping his family not starve. And while he gets thrown into prison, he becomes this really bitter man. And he's oppressed and he's abused there and it's super harsh. And they finally let him go free is the way that the story goes. And when he goes free, everybody treats him like an ex-con because he is. And they all, all treat him like, a, like he's less than everybody else. And he gets more and more bitter. 
and he finally ends up in this like monastery slash church kind of a thing. And this bishop welcomes him in and says, come and eat with us and come and you're going to stay with us for the night. And, and, and because it's this kind of a church where there's a lot of money around, there's like solid silver silverware, okay? And all Valjean sees is if I steal that, I can hawk it at a pawn shop and I can get a new start. And so he waits for everybody to go to sleep and he steals all the silverware that he can out of there and he makes a run for it and the cops catch him again. And history is repeating itself. And the cops drag him back to the bishop because they want the bishop to be the star witness against him that yeah, he did this thing. And the bishop has a choice right here in this moment. So this is what the bishop says. Now you can read it. He says, ah, here you are, he exclaimed. I'm glad to see you. Well, but how is this? I gave you the candlesticks too, Valjean, which are of silver like the rest and for which you could certainly get 200 francs. Why did you not carry them away with the forks and the spoons? What a great moment. The bishop says, actually, I, I sent him with those. Those were a gift for me. And Valjean, you didn't steal enough, basically. The police are like, are you kidding me? I guess we got to let the guy go. And, and so they leave Valjean there in the bishop's presence and they leave. And then the bishop kind of grabs Valjean for a minute and they talk just the two of them. And this is what he says. He says, Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from the black thoughts and the spirit of destruction and I give it to God. Do you see the truth? What a mix. So he saves him. And then he says, I saved you to free you. I'm going to put an obligation on you right now that you not go back to your old life because it's just going to get you back there again. I've bought you into this moment. Grace and truth. You're like, well, how was he so creative? How is he able to do that? I think the only way is to be full of him who is. Amen. Would you guys stand? I think it's fun to study about Jesus. I think it's fun to get to know Jesus better. I think we think that we know Jesus and then we got to get closer. We got to look again. And we got to see some things that we've never seen before about him because he's our Lord, guys. And like, we want his character to come into us and to change us from the inside out. Full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these people that are here today, God. I thank you that you woke them up. I thank you, God, that you got them here. I thank you, God, that you brought a level of trust and clarity today into this room. Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would come and, Lord, you would change us from the inside out, Lord, that you would change our hearts, God. And, Lord, the reality is some of us, Lord, we come from a place, maybe we come from family, we come from leaders, God, who are all grace or they were all truth, and we've just been confused for a long time. Help us, Lord, to see what we need to aim for. Change us, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.